All right, guys, uh, turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. Second Kings chapter 5. <coughs> a couple weeks ago, Jamie and I were driving back from somewhere. I don't remember where it was. And she was telling me about she was on, had the radio on in her car. And just randomly, um, seemingly randomly, uh, there was a message. There was somebody preaching a message on the radio. And she heard it, and the man was talking about the attributes of grace. And she said, turn it up because it was real good. And she was telling me about all the attributes this man talked about. Um, and I had this thought. How thankful I am that salvation is all of grace. That it is not conditioned upon me in any way, shape, or form. It is conditioned completely upon what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And that, that fills my heart with joy. I enjoy that. And there's things we know about grace. Number one, it's sovereign. It's sovereign. And that's because the one who bestows the grace is sovereign. He will show mercy to whom he will show mercy, and he will be gracious to whom he will be gracious, and to whom he will he'll harden. You know what this is? To harden man, all the Lord has to do is withhold that which softens, just not intervene. You and I sit in the palm of his hand to be done with as he sees fit. But you know what? I have to ask myself, how do I feel about that? What, what does that inspire in me? Peace? That I'm in his hand? It's the safest place I could possibly be in light of the gospel message. The best place I could possibly be. Grace is irresistible and invincible because... The one who gives the grace is irresistible and invincible. If he calls, you're going to come. That's just the way it is. Grace always saves its object. The Lord is going to be gracious to a man. He is going to be gracious to that man. He cannot fail. He is incapable of it. It's preserving grace. It's grace that's going to keep me all the way to the end. That means I'm not even responsible for preserving myself. And that just makes me really happy. I enjoy talking about that. This story here, 2 Kings chapter 5, this is the story of Naaman the leper. Name in the Syrian. This is an illustration of sovereign grace. That's what we're going to look at here this morning. Now, this is 14 verses. That's a lot of ground to cover. All we're going to be able to do is I'm going to read a verse and make a few comments to you, and hopefully the Lord will bless it, and he'll give you something out of it. So pick up in verse 1. It begins by giving a description of Naaman. Naaman is the representative man. He is the natural man. 2 Kings 5, verse 1. Now, Naaman captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Now, like I said, Naaman is a type of the natural man. If you'll notice here, there are four seemingly positive comments made about Naaman. He's a captain, an honorable man, a great man with his master, he's mighty in valor. Four seemingly positive comments are made, and then at the end, one negative but he was a leper. And the natural man, this is the way we are born in this world, this is what we believe about ourselves. This is what the natural man believes. I've got a lot of great qualities. I've got a lot of good things going for me. Listen, I hold down a job. I try to take care of my family. I coach Little League. And you know, I've never committed any really serious crimes. I've never raped anyone. I've never murdered anyone. Have I made mistakes? Have I sinned? Absolutely. Everybody makes mistakes. But, you know, compared to most other people out there, I'm doing pretty good. I've got a lot of good things going for me, but at the end, I just have this little sin problem. That's it. That's how the natural man views himself. And if the natural man has made a ruin of his life, let's say the Lord has just completely removed his restraining grace from that man, which can happen to any one of us at any moment, I'd add. But let's say he just removes his hand from a man, and that man just acts out on every wicked desire he has ever had and just made a ruin of his life, and he doesn't see any good abilities inside himself, any good characteristics. That man, at the very least, believes that he has the capacity to get better. Even if he doesn't want to, he believes that he has the capacity to. That if he chooses to, and he tries hard enough, and he works hard enough, he can lessen his sin, and he can raise in a personal righteousness. The natural man does not believe that he is totally depraved. Now, we're going to look at these five pointers, these five descriptors that are given here of Naaman. These are the five descriptors of the natural man. And while it looks like there's four good ones and one bad one, they are all negative. All negative. I'm going to show you that. First, the captain. The captain. Naaman is the captain. He is the lead general over the entire army of Syria. In this kingdom, he is second only to the king. This thing of being a captain speaks of this. Power, control, and authority. Who is in control? And this is the way we are born in this world. We are born in this world believing that we 
are in control. We are born in this world believing that we have a free will, and at every given point, we can accept the offer of salvation that is issued by the impotent God of our imagination, and it's completely up to our choosing. We are the ones who are in control. We've created a God that is impotent, that can only do what we will allow him to do, and we're the captain. We're the one who's in charge, and this is where the enmity comes out. This is where the depravity comes out. Because when the God of the Bible is preached to the man, that we all sit in the Lord's hands to be done with as he sees fit. He has the power to save, the power to damn, and it is right, just, and fair. Whatever it is he does, when the man sees that, the enmity comes out. And he shakes his fist and he says, I will not have that man to rule over me. And if you want a simple definition of total depravity, it's right there. Hatred of God. And that's the way we're all born into this world. He's a captain, but also says he's a great man with his master. Now, Naaman's boss thought very highly of him, thought very highly of him, and no doubt Naaman coveted that praise. We all like that, don't we? We all like hearing people speak well of us. Why? Because we love getting glory for our name. Every man enjoys hearing his name glorified. That's the way we're born in this world, and that's why men detest grace by nature. Because if salvation is by grace and it's completely conditioned upon what the Lord Jesus Christ has done, that means the man's works don't count. They just count against him. That's it. That means the man will have no glory in his salvation. He will just be a trophy of the Lord's power and his grace. And the natural man rejects that. He says, I won't have anything to do with that because there will be no glory for me. It says he was honorable. Honorable. Look this word up. This is interesting. The way it's used here, what it means is, is someone who is so highly respected that he will not be denied anything he asks. It is literally owed to him. And this is our problem. We believe we're owed something. We believe there's something that is respectable about our character, that the Lord actually owes us salvation. Look, I have done my part. Now come over here, meet me where I've come to you at. Now you do your part. We believe we're owed something. Folks, we're not owed a thing. And if we're to be given what we're owed, it's damnation. That's the truth outside of Christ. And finally, a mighty man in valor. Now, when you actually translate that out, you know what that means? Rich in strength. Rich in strength. And that's how we view ourselves. Rich in strength and spiritual ability. We have a pull ourselves up by the bootstrap mentality. That's the way we're born. We think we can believe anytime we want. We can repent anytime we want. We can actually produce love for God. All these things, we believe we are strong and we're capable. And the whole time, we are wretched, and we are poor, and we're miserable, and we're blind, and we don't even know it. And the worst part is we don't even know we're dead. The natural man can't see that he is dead. It takes an alive man to see a dead man. That's the case. And finally, it comes down to a leper. Look back in verse 1. At the end of that verse, where it speaks of him being a leper, notice it says, but he was. That but he was is in italics. That means it's provided by the translator, just not in the original. It literally just says all that, that he's the captain, that he's a mighty man. And then it just says a leper. Because if you roll all that together, everything Naaman was, he was just a leper. Same as you and me. Nothing but sin. Sin is what I am. It's my nature. It's how I'm born in this world. That's your nature, too. It's what I do, because that's what I am. And you roll all his qualities together, he's a leper. That's it. And here's the thing, folks. If the Lord has purposed to save a man... He's going to have to bring that man down, like he's going to do with Naaman. He has to wipe out all those other characteristics. He has to get rid of the captain, the mighty man, the honorable. All those things have to be wiped out until this is our single defining characteristic, a leper. Nothing more. And this is why grace must be sovereign, because if it was left up to a man to seek the Lord's face, to beg the Lord for mercy, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he can't, and he won't. That's the issue. But what's beautiful about this story is the Lord has purpose not only to cleanse Naaman of his leprosy, but to save him. And that means the Lord is going to intervene. And we get to watch that gracious intervention. Now pick up in verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God... My Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Now, if the Lord has purposed to save a man, he is going to cross that man's path with the gospel, the gospel of God's free grace. And that's what this little maid represents. She knows someone. 
she's seen someone, she's going to tell who she's seen and who, he know, who she knows. Now, it's interesting. Anyone who would carry this message, any witness, because that's exactly what she is, she's seen someone and she knows someone, they will fit this little maid's description. Number one, they will be little, largely insignificant. They'll be a servant. And number three, they'll be almost completely insignificant in any way. No one will probably ever know their name. Whoever the third party was that carried this little maid's message to Naaman, he probably went to Naaman and said, thus and thus said the little maid out of the land of Israel. And Naaman was like, who? Who are you talking about? I didn't know there was a little maid around here. He will be largely insignificant, but this little girl is a witness. A witness. She knows a man, Elisha, and that's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she has seen this man do amazing things. Right now, there is a man in glory, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is seated at the right hand of his Father, being equal with God because he is God. That's the case. This is Elisha here. This is the type, and this is her statement concerning this man. Would God, that's how she begins. Now what that means is everything she says after that is the sincere desire of her heart. That's what that means. And folks, shouldn't we sincerely desire the salvation of those people around us? Shouldn't we pray for those that are around us? Somebody prayed for you and me. Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. This is her witness statement. Everybody who's with him, everybody who comes to him, he will recover them. Isn't that the call of the gospel? Everybody who comes to him, he will recover them. Revelations 22, 17 says, And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Now, what does that mean to come? In Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer said this to Paul. He said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And that is a, that is a great question. What must I do to be saved? And Paul didn't say, You fool. God is sovereign. Salvation is by grace. There's nothing you can do. That is not his statement. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And that is the call here. That is what it means to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to believe on him, to trust him for everything in your salvation. And the question always comes up, who can come? How do I know if I can, in fact, come? Well, verse 17 here gives us some markers. Number one, it says, and let him that heareth come. Now, folks, this is the gospel. This is the good news, that salvation is in no way conditioned upon the works of a man. It is completely conditioned upon what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And he has accomplished that for his people. Is that good news to you? That your works aren't involved. If anything, they just count against you. They're sins that had to be atoned for. It is completely dependent upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that good news to you? Because if it is, you've heard. You've heard. You've been given an ear to hear. You fit the description. Come. Don't wait. Let him that is a thirst come. A thirst. What's a thirst? A conscious need. Todd has told us that so many times. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Do you need to be made righteous? You can't come up with a righteousness of your own. You need your sins completely washed away with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have to be made righteous, be made what you were not before. Do you need that? Come. You're thirsty. Come on. Whosoever will. And the question always comes up, okay, so you're talking about free will then. You're talking about a man enacting his free will. No. Man doesn't have a free will. Your will is tied completely to your nature. Yes, in your area of domain, you can choose. You can choose between sin and sin. You can choose between hatred of God and hatred of God. You can choose rejection and rejection. That's your, that's your span of influence right there. That's what you can choose between. Man doesn't have a free will. Your will is tied to your nature. But if you're willing to be saved this way, in a manner to where you're going to be nothing in this, just a trophy of the Lord's power and His grace, understand this. You've been made willing. You've been given a new will. That means there's a new man. There's a new nature in you. Come on. You're willing whosoever. And finally, he says, take it freely. Freely. That means it will cost you absolutely nothing. 
Now, I have heard that statement over the years several times, and it's absolutely true, absolutely true. But I've also heard this statement, and I like this. It will cost you one thing, one thing, and that is all your self-righteousness. Any reliance you have on yourself, any good work or experience you've held on to, it will cost you that. You will come naked and exposed. You will come with absolutely nothing, nothing. It has been said several times before, it will never be your sins that will keep you from the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be your self-righteousness. That is the only thing that stands in your way. And Naaman is not yet ready to part with his. He's heard audibly. He's heard the little maid audibly, but he hasn't heard in power. Go to verse 5. And the king of Syria said, let's stop there for just one moment. A little maid told him there was a man in Israel and he would recover him of his leprosy. Does he go to him? He goes to a king. He goes to the wrong place. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. He's trying to start a fight with me. That's what he's saying. He knows I can't do this. He's, he's trying to start a fight. Now here's what I see here. And it's really kind of simple. Naaman is told there's a man and he will recover you. No ifs, no ands, no buts about it. Not if you do this, he will. Come to him. He will recover you. That's the statement here. He doesn't go to him. He goes to a couple of kings, and these kings represent the law. Now, what did he get from the king of Syria? Silver and gold and ten changes of raiment and a letter of recommendation. Ten coverings. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like a man trying to establish his own righteousness by the deeds of the law. Ten commandments, ten coverings. That's exactly what that means. And here's what he wants. He wants a letter of recommendation. He wants to go to the law and say, I've kept you in least in some way, shape, or form. I've come away with something. It's written here on this letter, and I'm going to carry that to the Lord and say, look, look what I've done. I have made myself at least somewhat attractive. I have in some way earned your favor. Here you go. Now, look favorably upon me. But what does the king of Israel say? He says, am I God? To kill him to make alive? That he wants me to recover this man of his leprosy? I can't do that. He had no words of peace for Naaman. He had no words of comfort. He had no words of confidence. And going to the law, we will never find peace. We will never find comfort. We won't find any confidence because there is one word that the law has to say to all of us. Guilty. Guilty. That's all it says because that's its only purpose is to expose a man's sin. That's it. Now, look down at verse 8. Naaman had heard audibly, but now he's going to hear in power. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. This is exactly when you and I will come. When no longer we hear from a man, when we hear from the prophet, the Lord himself. And when he says, come now, you're going to come right now because grace, thankfully, is irresistible and invincible. But Naaman's going to continue to make a mess of things. I identify with him real well, and he's going to come the wrong way. Go down to the next verse. So Naaman came. Every time the Lord calls, a man comes. With his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Now, keep this in mind. Naaman is a big deal in the world. He's a general. He's second only to the king. And I've had limited experience with some generals. There's not that many in the American military. They're few and far between. But here's what happens. If you're an enlisted guy on a base, and there happens just by some whim to be a general standing anywhere in close proximity to you. Say you're walking around a corner and you just run into one. Here's what you're going to do. You're immediately going to come to the position of attention. You're going to render a salute. You're going to give the greeting of the day. And you're going to stand there just locked in in the position of attention until he dismisses you. 
And if he's on his phone or he's talking to somebody else and he's not paying any attention to, you're just going to stand there until he says, oh, yeah, go ahead, we'll go about your business. And that's what Naaman is used to. He's a man of power. He's a man of respect. He's used to people being penitent to him. And he is so proud and so pompous at this point, he won't even knock on Elisha's door. I know exactly what he's thinking. He's thinking, listen, he knows I'm coming. He, he knows I'm coming. He's probably been pacing around his house all day, anxiously awaiting a man of my character. He's got to come out to me. He's got to come to me. That's exactly what he's thinking. Let's see what happens. Verse 10, And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now, number one, I want to address this. So here's what I envision happening. So Naaman's standing there, right? And he's a big deal. And he's standing in front of the door, and he's about that close to the door. And he's like, I'm not going to knock on this door. He's going to come to me. All right, he knows I'm here. I'm going to wait out here. He's going to come to me. I'm a big deal. And so he's standing that close to the door, and the door opens, and there's just a messenger here, and he's a nobody. And the messenger says, go wash in Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall return. And he slams the door. And just closes that, that far in front of his face. Can you imagine that, how infuriating... That would be. But the Lord has no respect for persons. We can be sure of that. But here's the greater issue. Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee. Seven, the number of perfection. Where is it a man can go and wash and be made perfect? To where his sins are no more. To where he stands righteous before God. What can wash away a man's sin? Y'all are singing the song in your head right now. I know you are. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But I wouldn't have you rest your hopes of salvation on a song. I'll give you a scripture for this. David said this. Psalm 51, 7. He said, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hyssop. What do we read about it? The Passover. The Passover. The night of the Passover, the Lord said, I'm going to pass through Egypt. I'm going to kill all the firstborn. And all the houses of the Egyptians, but you, my people, here's what you're going to do. Slay a lamb. You drain that blood into a basin. You take a bunch of hyssop, and you dip it in the blood. And you smear that blood over the doorpost and on the side post, and you get inside that house. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. There was one thing the Lord was looking for, and that was blood. And everybody who was inside that house with the blood over the door, they were safe and they were secure not for any other reason other than the blood. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing that can make atonement for a man's sin. That's it. The Lord was looking for the blood. And it's not the blood and. Hebrews 1.3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The issue, folks, is by himself. Not his blood, your works, not his blood and your sincerity, not his blood and your sorrow over your sins, not his blood and your faith. Blood alone. That's the only thing that can wash a man clean. And this is going to have a reaction in men. Let's see what the reaction is. Look at verse 11. But Naaman was wroth. The blood alone will make a man mad. So that means his works don't count. Which means he has to take his rightful place as every other sinner out there. Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Now Naaman's mad. Naaman's mad. And the teaching of the blood alone, that amends, it offends a man's sense of pride. And this is what Naaman struggles with. Same thing I struggle with, pride. Pride, he's got to be brought down. And he's mad, but he's also mad about this. He said, I thought. I thought. Write this down. Everything we naturally think about the Lord, how he saves sinners and ourselves, it's wrong. And I think this is interesting, what he says after that. He says, I thought he will surely come out to me. And here's what I thought about this. The call of the, the religion of today, the natural man's religion, is come any way you want. You just you, you come any way you want, come believing anything you want, come to any God you want. You can make him into anything you want and, and meet him on any ground you want, and that's absolutely fine. He'll accept you any old way. I thought he'd come out to me. The man says, I don't like that sovereignty thing. 
I don't like the fact that he's in control. I don't like the fact that, that he holds me in the palm of his hand. I don't care for that. I want a free will. I want some say in this. I want him a little low, lower and me a little higher. I want meet me on those grounds, meet me on this platform right over here and accept me. So listen, I don't have so much a problem with that grace thing. It's that all of grace thing. That bothers me. And what they'll say is, listen, what that'll do is if you preach that, it'll lead men to sin. What they mean is if you preach that, that means I have to take my rightful place as a sinner with everyone else. And all those works I thought I was performing over the years don't count for anything. I mean, I spent a lot of time not committing all those sins that I really wanted to commit. I mean, I have kept myself back. I have made myself as holy as I possibly can. And you know, you know what? I want to be met on those grounds. I want a bigger crown in glory. I don't like that all of grace thing. You can mix them, though. Meet me on these grounds over here. I don't like this holy God you're talking about. He's too strict. He's too unapproachable. No, I don't like him. He's got to come down some. I want somebody more like me. Somebody I wouldn't, I'd feel comfortable talking to them on a, on a first name basis. Somebody more like me. I don't like that unapproachable God. Meet me over here. Come out to me. Meet me where I want to be met at. Now, there's a half truth to there, and you guys know exactly where I'm going with this. The Lord will meet you on the grounds you come to him on. That's absolutely true. You want to meet him on the grounds of your free will, your works? Go ahead. But his demands will always remain the same. His demands are number one, worship. Number two, holiness. That's what he demands. And by nature, we can't come up with those things. We cannot make ourselves holy. We cannot make ourselves righteous. We cannot worship God. We lack all that ability. He demands that. And you want to come on those grounds, that's fine. Well, it's not fine because you're going to be turned away. But if you want to come on the grounds of free grace, free grace, pleading the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ alone, he will meet you on those grounds. Come to me. Come to me. Nothing stands in your way but you. That's it. Also said this. Look back at verse 12 and look at the, the last verse. It says, so he turned and went away in a rage. Let me ask this question. <clears throat> if Naaman walks away and he refuses to walk in Jordan and to wash in Jordan <clears throat> and he goes out to the desert and he dies in that desert, a leper, is anybody going to blame Elisha? Is anybody going to hold Elisha accountable if Naaman walks away and says, no, I won't wash in Jordan, and he goes out and he dies in the desert, a leper? No one says, no, this is Naaman's fault. If Naaman walks away, that's on Naaman, absolutely. Now let me tell you this. Before time began, God elected a people in Christ Jesus. He chose them unto salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world. He lived for those people. He bled for those people. He died for those people. And he returned those people back to his father. He accomplished their salvation. But only those people, those particular people. Does that make you upset? It shouldn't because the picture is the exact same. We are all born in this world running towards the gates of hell as fast as we possibly can. Shaking our fist in the face of the Lord. Wanting nothing to do with him. Nothing to do with his grace. And nothing to do with his gospel. And if the Lord chooses not to intervene with a man. To not give a man what the man doesn't want in the first place. Anybody going to hold him accountable for that? Anybody going to say he's wrong? Folks, election does not exclude men who want to be saved. And that's how the world poses us. There's this great number of people who wish to be saved. They're crying out for mercy. And the Lord just says, no, I just, I just didn't choose you. That's not the type. The type is everyone is shouting, crucify him, crucify him. But he intervenes with some of us. And that's amazing that he would intervene with any of us. Look at verse 13. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? What they're saying here is, Naaman, if he would have told you to take on an entire army by yourself, you would have done it. If he would have told you to climb a mountain, if he would have told you to burn your leprosy off with fire, you would have done all those things. You would have done any of those things, but all he's saying is wash and be clean. Do a very simple thing. And I remember being young. I don't know how young I was, probably 14 or 15. I was sitting right over there. Donnie Bell was up here preaching. This is the first illustration I ever think I heard in power. And Donnie Bell said this. He said, if I sold you salvation, it cost you $10,000. Everyone in this room would come up with $10,000. You'd come up with ten grand for you, for your wife, for your kids, 
Everybody would come up with the money. You go into debt, you'd get five jobs, you'd rob a bank. You'd do whatever you had to do to get that money, wouldn't you? But I tell you, it's free. That's absolutely free. It costs you absolutely nothing. In fact, the only prerequisite that there is to getting it is to have nothing, to be completely bankrupt, just an empty-handed bankrupt sinner. And it's free. And all you do is rest. Nobody wants it. Here's what I thought. I was like, I want it. <laughs> I want it. I'm empty. I'm bankrupt. I want it. That sounds good. But that's good news to a sinner. That's good news to a sinner. Now, a man who's righteous, who has his own righteousness, he's full of silver and gold, and he's got his ten chains of raiment, that's bad news. That's bad news. He's not going to have that big crown he's looking for. But to a sinner, somebody's bankrupt, wash and be clean, sounds great. But Lord, wash me. Wash me. All right. The next verse, verse 14. Now, this is what happens when the Lord breathes spiritual life into a man, and he brings a man to a repentant state. Now, Naaman said, I thought. I thought, he's going to change Naaman's mind. He's going to turn him. He's going to do a work of grace in his heart. Let's watch what happens. Then went he down. This is what happens when the Lord does a work of grace in a man's heart. He comes down. Here's what I envision happening. So Naaman is walking off, and he's mad, and he's like, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. I'm not going to deal with that. I won't have any part of it. I'll die a leper. I don't care. And he's walking along, and there's a still, small voice talking to him the whole time. And all of a sudden, you see him walk away, and he turns, and he just starts walking back. And his face was mad before, right? But now it's, it's softened and everything, and he starts walking towards Jordan. And he's wearing his general's uniform, right? So he's got a big stack of ribbons, and he's got a, all his garb on, a hat, shoes, things like that. And he's trying to cover up as much of his flesh as he possibly can because he's a leper, Right? he starts walking towards Jordan, and all of a sudden you see the hat come off. He throws it aside. Keeps on walking, you see the shirt come off. He throws it aside. Kicks off his shoes. The pants come off. And there he stands on the banks of Jordan, naked and exposed, in front of his servants, in front of Elisha, in front of himself. And he's no longer a captain. He's no longer a great man. He's no longer honorable. He's no longer a mighty man in valor. Now he's just a leper. That's all everybody can see. And that's all he can see. He just sees those sores and those wounds and those scabs. That's all he can see. He's not those great things anymore. Now he's just a leper. And now he's a candidate for mercy. Watch what happens. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Imagine seeing this. So he gets down that water, goes under once, comes back up, nothing. Under again, up, nothing. All time. Seventh time, he springs up out of there. And he's got new flesh. Like a newborn child. Something new that was not there before. A holy man. Now, what does this look like? If you were to watch Naaman do this, he goes... Above the water, under the water, and back up. What does that look like? What is something we do in our day that looks just like that? It's like a baptism, doesn't it? A baptism. In believer's baptism, what are we confessing? Confessing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, that he is our only hope. When we stand above the water, we're saying when he lived, when he established that perfect righteousness, my hope is that's when I lived, that I was in him. And when he walked the paths of righteousness... I walked into in him. And when he died, he died bearing my sins. He died bearing me in his body. And when he died, I died. And when he was raised again, signifying the full satisfaction had been made with his father, my hope is I was raised again in him. Incorruptible. A holy man. What this is pointing to is the obedience of faith. Now, I'm going to leave you with four questions. Four very important questions. Number one, did the dipping in Jordan, the waters of Jordan, did that wash away Naaman's leprosy? No, it did not. The Lord washed away Naaman's leprosy, the will of God, the purpose of God. God himself washed away Naaman's leprosy. Let me ask this. Does faith save a man? Strictly speaking, no. 
The Lord saves a man. The will of God saves a man. The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ saves a man. Faith believes that. Faith is the byproduct of the Lord saving a man. He saved us and he called us with the holy calling. What came first? The saving. And everybody he saved, everybody he died for, they will believe. Now, would Naaman have been cleansed if he refused to dip in Jordan? No. Will a man be saved if he refuses to come to the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Now I'm going to leave you here, right here. Your command is not an invitation. It is a gracious command. Your command right now, you, pretend you're the only person sitting in this room, is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you're coming to him, the emphasis is on who you're coming to and not what you're leaving. You are leaving yourself, leaving any hopes of a salvation based on your own merits, and you're coming to Christ and you're casting all your cares on him and trusting him alone. And that is what you are commanded to do right now. Obey the command. Thank you all. Let's stand and sing the solid rock, 272, 272.